African UN Women and UN OPS. And our, the title of our session is COVID-19 Hold of Society Recovery, Priorities for Health System Strengthening Following a Risk Management Approach. Um, our session will share with you examples of national policy options and examples of how increasing investment in strengthening health system and health security in a sustainable green and risk-informed recovery from COVID pandemic may be done. Given the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on people living in vulnerable conditions, strategies must be inclusive and prioritize actions for people who are at most of the risk. There will be a focus of our session on the discussion of scaling up of priority actions based on the lessons from COVID and applying all hazards hold of society and risk management approaches. Um, in our session, um, we are lucky to have um, the opening remarks um, shared by Dr. Tedros Ebriasis, I mean, our Director General of WHO, together with five distinguished panelists, um, which include um, Mr. Kunta Nugraha, and also I understand that today he will be represented by Dr. Singha, thank you. And we have um, Mr. Anel Pokrel, um, the CEO of the National Council of Disaster Risk Reduction and Management of Nepal. We have Mr. Stefan Kola, the Senior Infrastructure Resilience and Project Management Advisors of UNOPS. Uh, Mrs. Penapi Namam, um, Directors of International Cooperation Section of the Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation, Ministry of Interior of Thailand as nominated by UN Women, and Ms. Clara Elessad, our Technical Officer of Gender Health Security Preparedness Department of WHO Health Emergencies Program. And um, without further delay, given that we only have one hour to, to have this very important discussion, I will first start with um, opening this session with um, Dr. Tedros' remarks. So the technical team, will you please share um, the video rec uh, recording of um, his uh, speech, please. Oh, I actually forgot to introduce myself. Um, this is Emily, and I'm the coordinator, I'm moderator of this particular session. Um, I am the assistant dean of um, Chinese University of Hong Kong and the CEO of um, Jigs Foundation, which is based in Hong Kong, which focuses on medical humanitarian assistance across the Belt and Road region. Okay, so thank you. Back to the um, administrative team. Will you please share Dr. Tedros' remarks? Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, the COVID-19 pandemic has made many of us reconsider the future we want for our world, our countries, and our communities. We have seen how weak health systems leave societies and economies at risk. Even as we continue to respond to the pandemic, we must also work towards recovery and reconstruction. In the short term, we must work to restore essential health services affected by the pandemic. But we must also seize this chance to build resilient health systems underpinned by strong primary health care. Vulnerable and marginalized populations must be at the center of our efforts. In every country, the last two years have exposed the deep inequities in health outcomes. WHO's vision is to support all people to enjoy the highest attainable standard of health, both physical and mental. We cannot do this without working across borders, sectors, and businesses to embrace a whole of society approach to health, to reduce the risks of disasters, and emergencies. I urge you to focus on actions we can take forward. Actions, not words, are the key to rebuilding a healthier, safer, and fairer world. I thank you. 
So thank you very much for Dr. Tedros for the opening remarks. I think he set the tone for today's discussion. Um, this is a health session. So we are interested to see health, how could it be? And it should be a center part of the discussion of disaster risk reduction and recovery. Um, let me, without further, further delay, um, invite the first panelist speaker, uh, which is, I mean, represented by Dr. Eka Singa, the Director of Center of Health Crises of the Ministry of Health of Indonesia, on behalf of Mr. Kunta de Graha, the, sec uh, the Secretary General of the Ministry of Health of Indonesia. So Dr. Singa, thank you. Um, the technical team, would you please share the PowerPoint, I believe was prepared for, uh, for the discussion. So Dr. Singa, it's to you now. Okay, thank you very much for the time. And uh, before I'm presenting the what we are doing to present now, we would like to extend my sorry, very uh, very sorry, to Emily and also to the participant, because our Secretary General up to now is still in the legislation uh, meeting, so he give me the he appointed me to give the presentation of. Uh, some HAD, some HD of Indonesia. So uh, please share the presentation, uh, our colleagues. Dr. Seng, I'm sorry. Let me just make sure that technical team, where is the PowerPoint? <laughs> I think we have, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can all of the participants uh, can read the presentation or not? No, the first, the first uh, presentation. I'm so sorry for this. Yes. Okay, Excellency, distinguished delegates of all the participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Indonesia, from Jakarta. Uh, allow me to deliver ASEAN health sector intervention on building regional health system resilience and accelerating COVID-19 recovery. Next slide, please. Okay. Relevant to the lesson learned from the current pandemic, an ongoing ASEAN health-related initiative on COVID-19 response, the 15 ASEAN health minister meeting and related which was conducted in 11 until 15 May in Bali, Indonesia reaffirmed their commitment in further advancing the achievement of ASEAN health sector development with the agreement to the further prepare and respond to health challenge through building regional health system resilience and accelerating COVID-19 recovery. And the other is optimizing the mobilization of essential health resources in responding to public health crisis. As we know that health crisis has already get in Indonesia, but also in the over the world. And the other is strengthening access to vaccine, therapeutic and diagnostic and other essential medicine supplies, implementing mutual recognition of COVID-19 vaccination certificate, promoting one health approach and strengthening health system for sustainable universal health coverage. And the other is pursuing the implementation of ASEAN post 2015 health development agenda, as well as fostering closer collaboration and dialogue, and dialogue with ASEAN partners. Next, please. Next slide, please. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, to better protect communities from impact of different health emergency, we must seize this opportunity to build our societies back better applying whole of society, whole of governance, and all hazards approaches. We call on all policymakers to continue building health system resilience 
and accelerating COVID-19 recovery that incorporate sustainable risk management measures, resilient health infrastructure, and universal health coverage through a primary health care approach and essential public health function at the center of all recovery effort. Investing res resilient health system that provide equitable and accessible high quality essential health services must be considered as the prerequisite for social, economic, and political stability given the massive economic and social impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. On that note, I think we have already give some a presentation and thank you very much for the kind attention. Thank you very much to Dr. Singer. There's no shot of that he's definitely an expert of crisis response and uh, really appreciate it. We would have a short session of um, Q&A um, after all the presentation. So we'll wait okay. to listen to your further comments, but very, very much appreciate it. So with no further, 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 I mean, I mean, um, waiting, we will go now to our next uh, presenter, Mr. Anil Pokhel. I'm the CEO of the National Council for Disaster Risk Reduction and Management of Nepal. Um, he's going to share with us an I mean, interesting experience of I mean, the country, I mean, the context of um, recovery from COVID, how is the health system maybe strengthening. So if I may direct the presentation to Mr. Pokhul, please. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Emily. Uh, Good evening, everyone, um, from wherever you are attending, or perhaps good morning uh, in the other part of the world. I'm Anil Pokhrel, and I'm the Chief Executive of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority. Uh, what's really interesting is uh, NDRMA was established, my office where I'm the Chief Executive was established the very month when the first initial cases of COVID crisis began popping up. Uh, this is where it allowed us an opportunity to really work with uh, with the health ministries, health-related uh, agencies. Uh, so it, Nepal was not an exception, especially in, comes, in terms of uh, the, the COVID crisis. Uh, so the vulnerabilities that we mentioned earlier during the presentation are also a, a reflection of what, uh, what we've experienced in Nepal. Uh, over the next bit of presentation, I'm going to share five key areas uh, that has uh, that has substantially improved uh, over, over the last two years. That has substantial bearings in the way how such crises are managed, and more importantly, it has crossover with the disaster risk reduction and management community within within Nepal. Uh, so the first one is a substantial increase in investments on health infrastructures and, and equipments. Um, if we reflect back uh, two years and, and a situation right now, uh, we could see that, again, there's, there's been tangible investments in terms of building health facilities, particularly hospitals and, and health facilities throughout the country. This also timed well with the Nepal, with government of Nepal's reconstruction and recovery following the 2015 earthquake. Uh, so nearly 1,000 hospitals had been rebuilt, uh, reconstructed, and retrofitted. Uh, after the 2015 earthquake. So building on these experiences, designing and constructing health facilities that withstands not only a, um, earthquakes, but also other, other disasters, particularly floods, landslides have been a key element of Nepal's reconstruction and the new construction of, of health facilities and health infrastructures. In addition to that, again, uh, similar to the other countries around the world, uh, there's also been huge investments, especially in terms of equipments, ventilators, uh, oxygen plants. Uh, from almost a, a very limited baseline, now almost every hospital that has more than 50 beds uh, have oxygen plants uh, installed into it. Uh, of great importance is the 
construction of the holding centers uh, within the Nepal and India border border regions. There's a there's a there's a large migrant community working in India and also in in Middle East and other countries around the world. So flocks of people started coming back, and so this is where again uh, <clears throat> designing, constructing holding centers uh, along these borders, and also at the Trivandrum International Airport, the only international airport in Nepal. Uh, was of critical importance. So, so these holding centers have been have been recently constructed, and so these um, these holding centers would also work as uh, as safe shelters uh, for people affected by by floods and landslides. And so, in times of such emergency arises, we could use these holding centers to to house those those families in those holding centers. So, it's not a, a single purposely uh, designed systems, but but it has huge crossovers with disaster risk management and emergency response. In addition to that, again, a large number of temporary and permanent uh, health emergency operation centers were set up uh, throughout the districts, throughout the provinces. Uh, labs, uh, the, the labs have been a critical component of the whole uh, COVID crisis management from what it used to be uh, collecting those samples and sending over to Hong Kong uh, back then uh, to having it decentralized down to a provincial level. Uh, of, of interesting crossover with other ministries and departments is the Ministry of, uh, of Livestock, where uh, for animal-related disease surveillance, some of those, uh, those labs have been now converted into labs that would also kind of cater for, for COVID crisis. Um, I also want to mention that, again, the number of hospital beds have, have substantially increased from what it used to be a baseline. So all in all, so number one is the, the massive investments in the health infrastructures, the equipments, and, uh, and the capacity to manage this, uh, these infrastructures have, have substantially, substantially increased. Number two you know, is, again, to manage all this, all required a, a massive uh, input into the improvements of the coordination system, including the human capacity systems. Uh, none of us had been exposed to such such crisis before. And secondly, while we were going through some of those peaking uh, peaking episodes, this was also the timing when uh, when we also had to confront with uh, with floods and landslides, and so it required coordination with multiple agencies and ministries. Um, and so, so the, one of clear examples of good coordination mechanism is the health clusters uh, worked with various um, NGOs and non-governmental agencies, uh, development partners. Uh, thirdly, on strengthening the capacity um, throughout, uh, throughout the country, starting from at the national level, uh, percolating it down to the communities and to the ward levels. Uh, so this also meant swapping off again trained staff to areas where there is heightened crisis. Fourth, uh, uh, a massive improvement into how risk communications are made, especially for addressing such such crisis, uh, from setting up daily uh, situation report, daily uh, communication cells within ministry, but also organized press meets, but also about organizing a campaign throughout the country using multiple kind of media. Um, has been something that will hugely benefit by the larger disaster risk management community. Uh, lastly, the, the drive for, for vaccines. Uh, Nepal has been an example case, especially for within, within Southeast Asia, where it has been able to successfully conduct a, a vaccine uh, campaign, uh, especially looking at uh, non-vaccine producing countries. Nepal has been considered a very successful case. So organizing around these things have been have, have really instilled in, in capacities and systems that will have substantial implications with the overall management of disaster risk reduction and other crises that could unfold on in the times to come. Uh, so these are five key key areas that I would want to kind of share with with this with the panel members and also uh, participants participating in this uh, in this forum today. Uh, I'll stop here. I'll pass it back to you. Who, you over to you, Emily. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Bukuyo. I'm really, again, a very insightful presentation, especially you mentioned the repurposing of facilities that uh, would probably fit better to support the human responses and also the capacity of dual disasters um, and that can co shared I mean, of the skills. It's also one of the themes which WHO has been highlighting related to health emergency disaster risk management, the co-sharing and all has its approach. So we definitely want to hear from you further later 
uh, during the discussion. Um, if I may, uh, for the benefit of audience, I mean, this is a hybrid session. Um, there are online participants, so thank you for the physical audience. Uh, bear with us uh, that, that there seems to be this need of holding on to the technical side of um, discussion because there really it's a group of people all over the world who's trying to tap in to join. And I'm actively aware that uh, uh, Mr. Prokuru is actually a representative to be physically present um, in the stage. And that is also very important to us uh, to make sure this is uh, with real face and real discussion. So thank you very much. And now, if I may, um, I want to introduce our next speaker of the panelists, uh, uh, which is Mr. Stefan Kola, the Senior Infrastructure Resilience and Project Management Advisor of UNOPS, which is also a co-organizing partner of this session. He's going to share with us a very interesting examples and his insights about the topic. So, Stefan, please. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody depending where in the world you are. Um, I think let's jump straight in, given, given the limited time that we have. Um, I think, you know, there's general agreement that the COVID crisis clearly exposed, you know, weaknesses in health systems in many countries around the world. If I look at this sort of from, a, from an infrastructure perspective, we, we see that this is really an inability to deal with the demand that was sort of placed on the health system. And, and how do we look at the health system um, when I look at it sort of from an infrastructure perspective? And, and the way we see it is as a system that's made up of um, a capacity in the system, which is your human resources, the financial resources, organizations, et cetera, that are responsible for sort of managing and operating the system. And then we have the infrastructure component, the, the sort of assets, as we call them, the physical hardware that sits in the system. These are the buildings, um, the equipment, the things that you use to deliver the health service. Essentially what we deal with then is, is sort of what I call a problem of supply and demand. Is there enough capacity and assets in the system to actually um, meet the demand? If the demand increases, or there's a sudden huge increase in demand, as we've seen with COVID, there's kind of two things we can do, and you can do one or the other or both. We can increase the capacity in the system. We can add more people, we can add more money, you know, we can change organizational structure, but that has its limits. Ultimately, we need what um, Anil was talking about, is additional assets have to be created to increase the capacity. And we do this either through the acquisition or the <clears throat> building of you know, hospitals, buildings, clinics, et cetera. The question that then comes into play, which is now becoming relevant in, in our situation is, what happens to all of this additional infrastructure that's been created? Um, you know, what do we do with these assets? Um, and, and, and how do we, manage these assets once the sort of increased demand has passed. Um, and I think it's really essential coming back to the point that because the health system was possibly weak in the first instance, now that we've created all these assets, we really need to capitalize on this additional demand or supply that has been created in the systems that we can effectively use. And the way we, we're proposing this is through proper and effective A, management of these assets. Um, and in some cases, there's even opportunity to potentially repurpose the assets or as has already been pointed out for sort of dual or multiple uses of the assets. An interesting example I wanted to share with you <clears throat> was some of the work that we've been doing in, in Bangladesh uh, with the Global Fund and the Ministry of Health um, which is around the installation of increased oxygen supply capacity in, in 29 hospitals in Bangladesh. Uh, this has actually involved the installation of oxygen generation plants to increase the, the capacity in the system. Um, clearly now that the, the pandemic is, is hopefully um, declining and the numbers are suggesting that, the question arises, what do we do with this additional capacity that's been created? And in this instance, 
what we're looking at doing is actually modifying some of the equipment so that hospitals that have the oxygen generation plants can actually then also have a facility to fill oxygen cylinders, which they can then use to supply hospitals that don't have their own generation capacity. Now, some of these hospitals were reliant on private sector suppliers uh, to provide oxygen to them. That became clearly difficult at times during the pandemic. So this way we can use some of that additional capacity to reduce the risk in other hospitals or other facilities that we're relying on, on private sector support for this to happen. So that's one way we, we, we're looking at sort of repurposing to, to reduce the risk, but also maintain this additional supply that we have in the system. Another example, um, and again, Anil, coming from the work we're doing with, with the ministry in Nepal, um, similar exercise of installing oxygen generation plants at a number of um, hospitals. But there we're working um, in the sort of post-construction stage with the ministry and with the hospitals and with the staff to, to teach them and build capacity own to maintain, own and operate these facilities so that the investment that was made in them is not lost, because often that's the problem we have, where uh, increased assets or assets are created, but then they're not effectively managed in the long term. And in four, five, six years' time, when you have another crisis and you turn to those assets to support you to deliver increased supply, they're not available. So there we're trying to build the capacity in the system to effectively manage those assets um, so that it reduces the risk of a pandemic like this happening again and there being a lack of supply in, in the system. So just some examples of, of, of the kind of work that we are doing in, in Nepal and Bangladesh um, to deal with this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for, uh, I mean, very good um, examples um, in Bangladesh and also your insights about uh, the importance of um, material support and the resources uh, to potentially be able to use in a post-recovery world or post-COVID world, because it's not just about COVID, it's about how we prepare for other health risk crises and how do we better the system. So Stefan, we'll definitely wait to hear from you for more of your insights during the Q&A session. Thank you. Um, again, I, I must share with the audience that uh, for those of you who may miss the earlier part of the session, um, the organizers are committed to ensure all the presentations the videos will be available to general public. I mean, after the uh, the conference, um, of course, please uh, go and visit the conference websites. There are more information on that. But uh, for those who want to revisit the earlier presentation from Dr. Tedros all the way to um, now, what we are talking about, um, it's on video. So, if I may, um, invite the next panelist member, Mrs. Panapa. Nanam and Emmy, the directors of the International Cooperation Section of the Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation, <coughs> Ministry of Interior of Thailand. Um, uh, Amy is going to share with us, as I know, I mean, that uh, very important insights of how to think about stockpiling, uh, given the example of COVID. So let me just make sure that uh, to ensure that, uh, Amy, do you manage to? Oh, yes, I'm here. Yes, okay. The Good. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so now to you. Thank you. Oh, you are on site. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. Finally, you see you, uh, Emily, and he hello to everyone. I will say good day, good night, I, I guess, all over the world. Uh, first of all, I thank you for the WSO and UN Women for nominating me and sharing experience of the Thailand combating the COVID-19 with you guys today. Um, I'm going to Speaking on the soft side of it, um, the, the woman side, the vulnerable group side. So COVID-19 was taking us by surprise, of course, and um, it's been locked down for two years and it was taking a toll on our living. And and with um, with us, just normal people, is is hard. And, and, but then when you look at closely, it's the, for the women and other vulnerable groups, it's even harder. It's, and it's that 
totally changing the way of life and they make actually make them more vulnerable. Um, for Thailand, you know, I would like to share with you how women have become such a strong force in combating and providing care during the COVID-19. Uh, Thailand was one of, recognized as one of the few countries which could handle pandemic, um, the COVID-19 was effectively. Um, and it was um, actually the work of all those um, volunteers. Um, we were using a lot of the civil defense volunteer, um, the village help volunteer. Uh, we have about 2 million volunteers um, all over Thailand in helping us. And can you believe that it's about 60 to 80 percent are women? So, you know, so those are the ones who's working so hard. And our 80 percent of our help worker are women as well. So not only are they affected by the COVID-19, they are taking care of everyone um, very hard. So, you know, we want to stress on that, that, you know, women have become such a strong force in providing the COVID-19 care, the screening and recovery in Thailand, and we need to recognize that. Um, the secondly, uh, Thailand is the host of the Disaster Emergency Logistics System of ASEAN, or we call it DELSA. Um, in the past uh, year, we have um, privileged to actually using the stockpile in DELSA um, to help with the uh, immigrant worker that was um, quarantined in the covid um, effect with COVID in Thailand, as well as our internal um, re response. Um, and our executive were um, realizing that, you know, a lot of, more than half of people who's got affected and that would need the personal hygiene kit um, were women and children, and some of them are even elderly. So he's initiated this um, alteration of the personal hygiene kit of ASEAN to be catered to women to children and to elderly and people with disability. Because each of those groups will need different materials, different things that will need them to, uh, to make sure that they are uh, taken care of during the quarantine periods. So those are initiatives that we're probably gonna take, carry it over and maybe making a proposal um, to maybe a heart center to taking in consideration of alteration of the stockpile um, design within so that we can taking care of our vulnerable group in ASEAN as well. One thing that, you know, after I got invitation to this, uh, to speak here, one thing that I run across is trouble um, in Thailand at the moment, which are we trying to address, is the data. Um, a lot of data about the, our disaster has not really segregated into gender, uh, even in the right age group. So right now, um, the DPM or NDMO of Thailand is working very hard to build up a, a new database um, in disaster um, management that we will make sure that it have a gender inclusion and definition as well as the age statistic um, to be able to identify and to propose the policy maker in addressing those vulnerable groups correctly for the disaster recovery. Thailand is also the chair of ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management and at the ASEAN regional level, ASEAN is one of the regional corporations that are very really advanced in taking care of these um, issues. We have the ASEAN Framework on Protection, Gender and Inclusion, which also um, come with uh, our implementation plan. It uh, was launched um, earlier this year and I think that's one of the key document um, that will be able to address those issues. Um, to this end, it's confirmed that DRR and COVID-19 recovery need to be in consideration of the contribution of women worker and volunteers. It need to be inclusion of vulnerable group and the data is everything and it need to reflect gender and all other information which would help us in crafting the DRR policy which is inclusive and reflect the whole of society approach. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That's a wonderful presentation. And I have to agree with you, the idea of this aggregate data to better reflect the needs is definitely essential across the world. But I'm so glad that uh, the Thailand example show that the stockpiling plans can be updated. Definitely a lot more to learn from you. Um, without further ado, I think that let me just invite our last panel speaker, uh, Ms. Clara Elisa, the technical officer of gender, Health Security Preparedness Department of WHO Health Emergency Program. I think, I mean, again, she's going to share with you the importance of, I mean, having the lens, the gender lens to think about this issue, because it's not just about COVID, not just about the post-COVID world. It's also about a fairer distribution of support 
and empowerment. Mm -hmm. okay, so let's make sure, let me make sure that Clara, um, do you manage to? Um, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, so please. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It is really my pleasure to join this panel today and these esteemed and honorable speakers on, on this important topic. Um, let me just dive right into it. Um, health workers are, as we all know, are making an extraordinary contribution to communities in the pandemic, coping with surging patient numbers, ongoing uncertainty, and risking their own health and safety. And we also know leaders across the world created special commissions to coordinate pandemic response at the global, regional, and national levels. And while 70% or more of the global health workforce is female, less than 30% of representatives in these decision-making committees were women. And why is this relevant for recovery? Well, because evidence shows that if recovery strategies remain top-down processes that disregard social dynamics and realities, including gender relations, it remains insufficient and ineffective. It misses out on essential knowledge and capacities needed to address the needs of everyone in society, especially those who are left most vulnerable by the impact of an event such as the COVID-19 pandemic. The same principles of inclusive participation and recognition of disproportionate risks of our diverse communities also needed to be applied to all aspects of vulnerability reduction and capacity development when managing risks and impacts of emergencies and disasters. As you all probably well know, the Sendai Framework of Action recognizes the importance of integrating a gender perspective in managing disaster risk and of promoting gender equitable policies. The relevance of gender, however, for disaster recovery goes beyond the recognition that gender inequality in decision making and leadership must be addressed. It calls for an understanding about how the gender power relations that affect everyday interactions also play a role in how individuals are vulnerable to, exposed by, and affected by the risks of disasters and can recover from them. Disasters are not experienced uniformly by everyone in society, as we have heard from numerous examples today. People of diverse gender identities, ethnicities and race, place of origin and age, face different risks and are affected differently by disasters, even if they all live in the same household. And they contribute in different ways to recovery efforts. Effective disaster risk governance must consider the ways in which gender dynamics influence disaster risks, impact, and recovery. Let me give you an example. We know the importance of retaining health professionals in rural remote areas where their affinity and engagement with communities and primary health care services are essential for reducing vulnerabilities and strengthening capacities for health security and resilience. Yet studies have found that when policies providing incentives to retain staff in these areas are gender blind, they miss out an opportunity to engage community, communities and break professional silos. In other words, if these policies are designed in consultation with female healthcare workers, such as the Thailand volunteers who sustained services during the pandemic, to understand what type of support they would need to continue working in these remote areas before, during, and after emergencies, then policies to retain staff would be more effective. Gender inevitably shapes human resources for health, and by accounting for it, recovery efforts can be more effective. The interaction of gender and other factors that affect risk and impacts, including poverty, disability, health status, and migrant status, is reflective of the systemic nature of risk that requires systemic solutions. The good news is that this shift towards a recovery that is focused on addressing root causes of disaster vulnerability and risk creation is already happening. At the global level, there is a renewed collective action to address gender equality and women's leadership under the Sendai framework. Following a joint study on the topic led by UNDRR, in which WHO participated, changes have been made to the Sendai reporting tool used by UN agencies, with questions amended to offer information on the extent to which gender inequalities are being addressed as part of disaster risk management. Guidance on improving gender and age disaggregated data is also prominent on WHO technical guidance notes on Sendai framework, reporting for ministries of health. More evidence has been produced on gender and COVID-19 than perhaps any other major pandemic in the past. Scholars and experts across regions have truly come together to investigate how the pandemic had a differentiated impact on women, men, and other identities. And this information is being translated to inform policies. More attention has been placed on the relevance of a gender equitable leadership for health, which reflects the contribution made by and draws on the experience from female healthcare workers everywhere. 
these are a few examples of things that are going in the right direction, but we know more efforts are needed if we want to truly achieve a transformative recovery from COVID. We need better and continued collection, analysis, use, and dissemination of disaggregated data, as has been pointed out already. We need continued monitoring of the pandemic's differentiated, differentiated impacts on different gender identities to determine which specific measures are needed. This includes targeted approaches to address gender-based violence as well as sexual and reproductive health needs. We need to ensure relevant technical expertise on gender issues in recovery and health emergency risk management and decision-making structures is available. We need to ensure women are well integrated at all levels into decision-making platforms with attention to minority groups being paid as well, since indigenous peoples hold valuable knowledge on environmental health that is essential for more sustainable green health system recovery. And last but not least, investments in the health workforce must continue to be prioritized. This is the very essence of resilient health systems and improving community health outcomes, particularly for those who are living in vulnerable conditions. Investing in health workforce is an investment in women and youth, and consequently a contribution to greater gender equality in health and for all societies. Apologies for going a little bit over time. Thank you for listening and I look forward to our Q&A session. Thank you, Clara. Um, again, appreciate your comments, which actually very well reflect the theme of our session. It's all about uh, how do we strengthen um, the system to ensure a more sustainable greener policy as also highlighted by Dr. Tedros at the beginning. Um, I think by this stage, because we uh, we would have about 10 minutes uh, for a Q&A session, my good team on site has helped me to gather some questions uh, for me to actually pose it back to the uh, panelists. Uh, we have panelists online, we have panelists on, on site. Allow me to try my best to ensure every single panelist will have uh, the chance to answer some questions. If I may start um, with, I mean, our first panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Singer, um, I think that the audience would want to understand uh, where do you see that multi-sectorial actors can make the strongest contribution to the strengthening of health system and potentially managing of health risks of emergence and disaster in the future with the current examples. Thank you, <clears throat> Emily. So if thank you very much. If we are talking about uh, for the multi-sectoral approach in the perspective of ASEAN, in the perspective of ASEAN, and we know that ASEAN is a region in the context, it is very big region in the context of natural disaster. It is identified as the public health emergency. So in the ASEAN health sector, we are doing the actively and consistently contributed to join task, task force in humanitarian assistance and disaster response and also implementing project for strengthening ASEAN regional capacity and disaster health management, and also prepare and develop the coordination of emergency medical team in ASEAN. Uh, we are doing the standard operat operating procedure of the ASEAN EMT, and also coordination external partner to enhance inclusive in ASEAN. And the other thing is, uh, the ASEAN also built the ASEAN Institute on Disaster Health Management. So multi-sectoral approach is very important, not only for the government, but, but also the non-government uh, organization, all, including the academic and also uh, non-government uh, organization. Uh, Indonesia has been appointed also as the WHO Collaborating Center for training and research disaster risk reduction, and also the host of ASEAN Institute on Disaster Health Management. And now uh, we are commitment in transforming our national health system through the, and, uh, and to strengthening the primary health care, peripheral health care, health security, 
health financing system and also human resources and health technology. So uh, we have to integrate it all the our effort in the regional and also the national level. That's uh, thank you, pa, uh, Mr. Mrs. Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Senga. I think that I um, appreciate your comments, especially you highlight, even I mean, I mean, for this platform, this discussion, it includes um, institutional um, actors, non-government um, actors, and also academics. We all have to work together and think about our general solution. So I appreciate very much, Dr. Senga. And if I may, I mean, I have a several questions for Mr. Prokiru, who is actually on stage, but uh, if I may just pick one, important ones that uh, probably will give the weight to today's uh, topic. It's that, of course, we are thinking about recovery. Um, it serves as the bridge between emergency response and future actions for prevention, preparedness, and reduction, um, especially with the concept of build better. From your point of view, what may be some long-term effects of COVID-19 pandemic, which would definitely be need to be addressed in the recovery time so that we hopefully in the future have to come across other pandemics like influenza and so on and so forth. We can do better, at least from the perspective of health system and your experience. Would you mind to share with us? Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, Emily, I think- Oh, um, sure. Um, I see that. Uh, okay, let me just go slower, okay? Um, I think one of the highlights of today's discussion is how do we build better using the opportunity of the recovery, the resources available. Um, from your point of view, what are some important long-term effects that are left behind by the COVID-19 that need to be addressed actively? during the recovery phase, at least from system point of view, to maximize the way we can rebuild the society. Thanks, Emily. And, and sorry for, uh, for the repeating, for asking to repeat the question. We all know that, again, this, uh, this particular crisis has, uh, has hit us, hit us hard. Uh, but assuming that it's gonna be the only time that we will see is, is gonna be the biggest mistake of our lifetime. Uh, we've seen uh, various waves of it, uh, and in one form or the other, we might might experience other waves of it, or perhaps in different different uh, forms. So, so this uh, this particular crisis uh, that we've collectively addressed over the last two years is something that we should take lessons for, uh, and to prepare for perhaps a, even a, a worse one. Uh, that's number one. Number two is we've seen the interconnectedness with, with other sectors, uh, particularly around uh, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Home Affairs in the, in the Nepali case, uh, where health institutions alone, alone cannot be, cannot, and without the help of, uh, help of other, other provincial and local governments, including the role of, of uh, non-governmental actors, private sector, such kind of complex uh, crisis cannot be managed alone. Number three is we need to be prepared. We need to be, we need to be be investing in, in preparedness for for such crisis in the future that it might come come through. And so, if we take it take these key lessons as how we could work as a whole of a society and a whole of a government approach going forward, uh, we will then only be able to address such complex disasters, and that that's very likely that could happen uh, in our in the next next few years. Uh, these are these are my key takeaways, uh, reflecting back on the last two years' experiences, and especially charting out as how we could uh, go ahead on on this current situation. Yes. Over to you. Thank Amy. you. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, Bukaro. It's definitely insightful and uh, worth actually writing it out as an essay for like for publications because I think more people should reflect on, on this particular aspect. Um, let me just get further. Um, Emily, um, sorry, there's yes? also. There's a follow-up question here from the floor. If we could give, ah, good. Uh, give the yes, please. Anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, address my question to Mr. Pocharel. 
Um, so you talked about repurposing health facilities, and which is actually a very good idea. Now that you know we're talking about recovery, but would you be able to share with us uh, if there are like you know, very, if you can underline a plan, uh, if you have such a plan of making, um, of transitioning from a COVID-19 that's a pandemic to COVID-19 as an endemic disease. Is Nepal already considering that, that uh, COVID is already becoming an endemic disease since we're talking about recovery. And if it is, then uh, could you share just maybe two or three points about that plan if there's already such a plan? Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, just earlier today, the government of Nepal released its, uh, its annual uh, program and plans uh, that lead to the, the release of its budget later, later in, in a month time. Uh, what it does is actually it reflects on this this issue that we all are grappling with. How could we we take this gravitas in a way that we we really start looking at on a on a longer longer term horizon, uh, particularly from a NDRMA, the National Disaster Reduction and Management Authority's perspective. We're working in particularly in in three areas uh, for for this situation. First and the foremost, uh, to take an asset inventory of all this. Uh, physical infrastructures uh, so that we have uh, details of all these uh, physical assets down to, say, for instance, equipments, monitors, oxygen plants, uh, so that decision makers are able to know which of these instruments, which, are, which of these facilities are, are located where, uh, so that we could make these informed decisions. Uh, following up on that, there's a, a, a World Bank support to the National Disaster Reduction and Management Authority to undertake a, a nationwide structural integrity assessment of uh, of three types of buildings, and one of which is the health health structure, health facilities. So we're trying to look at again how would these infrastructures would fear upon if there's a, a major earthquake or a, a landslide or a flood. So having this system in place uh, would allow us to really think on those lines as as how could these these structures, these hospitals or health facilities, could be rebuilt or perhaps retrofitted or reconstructed. Second area that we're working with Ministry of Health is around uh, jointly collaborating in terms of data systems, as uh, as Amy mentioned. And how do we get disaggregated data uh, down to a community or down to a ward level? Uh, so unless we have that systems whereby municipal governments, there are 753 of them, uh, and they have the, the the mandate to again collect this data. So how do we use a framework that utilizes the national BIPA disaster risk management platform, where Every ward members, elected officials are being part of that that system. So there's been a, a very good example of again how Ministry of Health and the National Disaster Reduction Management Authority, including the the Health Emergency Operations Center, the National Health Emergency Operations Centers, are, are working on it. Um, thirdly, again, um, again, given that this is not a one-time crisis, uh, and the likelihood that we need to treat it as an endemic is that to invest on on awareness, on campaigns, on risk, on communicating such kind of risks. So this is where this is also an area where the National Disaster Reduction Management Authority and the Ministry of Health have been working together uh, in terms of taking it forward. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Rupakio. I was told by the organizer that I should close the session. Um, there are burning questions from the floor, which I can see. I mean, it's from my, my piece of uh, paper that was queued by my team. That, uh, that question's definitely direct to Clara and uh, I mean, Amy and also Stefan regarding um, gender issues, regarding some action points and related uh, issues about repurposing of stockpiling. Um, those are very important questions, and I would definitely refer the audience to outreach to, I mean, our speakers for a good discussion, because this is the opportunity for you to learn that there are very important uh, players in the front line. Uh, but if I may, um, humbly uh, close this session. I think um, uh, in view of time, I think at the beginning, um, Dr. Tedros has called in his speech for a healthier, safer, fairer world through the investment of recovery, using a whole of society action and approach and strengthening of health system, especially for the vulnerable marginalized population 
at the center of the efforts. And no shadow of doubt, after this discussion, regardless which angle approach you're trying to address COVID-19 world, health has to be an important part, if not the center of response and building of recovery. I think um, given the massive economic and social impact and the interconnectedness of this prolonged crisis, um, we have no doubt that the disproportionately affected uh, people that are living in vulnerable situations and in our workforce definitely deserve better investment and also the policy um, interests of strengthening our health system as to provide an equitable, accessible, high quality essential health service um, that must be considered as a prerequisite of social, economic, and political stability and progress, and to protect our communities for further future health emergencies. This includes better data, this aggregate data that highlights the importance of gender, the vulnerable, and I particularly like the idea that must include indigenous knowledge. Um, in this region, we have no absence of disaster. Many speakers highlighted that during this past 24 months, there are multiple disasters ongoing together with COVID. We should not forget about that. Never underestimate the importance of indigenous, indigenous knowledge, especially in this region, um, that um, we may not be able to invite speakers because of limited time, but we must remember that. So as the stockpiling, repurposing of facilities, staff retention efforts, the concern about gender violence and resource re dedication to the vulnerable population. So that probably is one of the ending notes. Please keep track of our final statement. And we are very eager to talk to you again very soon. Thank you very much. I have to start with my interpret, inter, uh, interpreters who try to bring the message across the world with different languages. Um, apology for any organization issues we tried. Uh, thank you very much for people on site who tried their best to ensure at least they understand why all these people around the world were screaming about uh, the online session. Um, I am very honored, I mean, located in Hong Kong, China, to be able to coordinate this. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Kusia and the WHO team in Geneva who helps with this. So without further ado, I am three minutes late, but at least I'm trying my best to finish this on time. So thank you very much for everyone. I'll reach to the speaker, to the panelists, because they would love to talk to you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mr. Pogrero. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, um, the Minister of Health. And I um, mean, all the speakers, um, again, good evening and hope to see you soon again.